Do you find multimodal learning interesting? We've been talking about visual language, like if combining those together, maybe audio, all those kinds of things. There's a lot of things that I find interesting in the short term, but are not addressing the important problem that I think are really kind of the big challenges. So I think, you know, things like multitask learning, continual learning, uh, you know, adversarial issues. I mean, those have, you know, great practical interests in the relatively short term. Uh, possibly, but I don't think they're fundamental. You know, active learning, even to some extent, reinforcement learning. I think those things will become either obsolete or or useless or easy mm-hmm. once we figure out how to do self-supervised representation learning or or learning uh, predictive world models. And so, I think that's what you know the entire community should be focusing on. Uh, at least people who are interested in sort of fundamental questions or, you know, really kind of pushing the envelope of, uh, of AI towards the next the next stage. But of course, there's like a huge amount of, you know, very interesting work to do in sort of practical questions that, that have, you know, short-term impact. Well, you know, it's it's difficult to talk about the, the temporal scale because all of human civilization will eventually be destroyed because the the the, the sun will die out, and even if Elon Musk is successful, multiplanetary colonization across the galaxy, uh, eventually the entirety of it will just become a, a giant black holes, and uh, that's going to take a while, though. Universe. So, but but what I'm saying is, then that logic can be used to say it's all meaningless. I'm saying all that to say that multitask learning might be you're saw you're calling it practical or pragmatic or whatever that might be the thing that achieves something very akin to intelligence f- while we're trying to solve the more uh general problem of self-supervised learning of background knowledge so the reason i bring that up maybe one way to ask that question i've been very impressed by what uh, tesla autopilot team is doing i don't know if you've gotten a chance to glance at this particular one example of multitask learning, where they're literally taking the problem, like, I don't know, Charles Darwin starts studying animals. They're studying the, the problem of driving and asking, okay, what are all the things you have to perceive? And the way they're solving it is one, there's an ontology where you're bringing that to the table. So you're formulating a bunch of different tasks. It's like over a hundred tasks or something like that, that they're involved in driving. And then they're deploying it and then getting data back from people that run to trouble. And they're trying to figure out, do we add tasks? Do we, like we focus on each individual task separately? Sure. In fact, half, so the, I would say, I would classify Andre Karpathy's talk in two ways. So one was about doors and the other one about how much ImageNet sucks. He, he kept going back and forth on those two topics, which ImageNet sucks, meaning you can't just use a single benchmark. There's so, like you, you have to have, like a, a giant suite of benchmarks to understand how well your your system actually works. Oh, I agree works. with him. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's a very sensible guy. Um, now, okay, it's it's very clear that if you're faced with a an engineering problem that you need to solve in a relatively short time, particularly if you have Elon Musk breathing down your neck, you're going to have to take shortcuts, right? You you. You might think about the the fact that the 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 right thing to do and the long term solution involves you know some fancy self supervised learning, but you have you know you know most breathing down your neck, uh, and you know this involves uh, you know human lives, and so you you have to basically just do the systematic uh, engineering and you know uh, fine tuning and refinements and try and error and and, and all that stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's called engineering. That's called you know uh, putting technology out uh, in the uh, in the world, um, and and you have to kind of ironclad it before before you do this. You know, um, uh, so much for you know grand grand ideas and principles. Um, but you know, I'm placing myself sort of you know some. You know, upstream of this, you know, quite a bit upstream of this. You're Plato. Think about Platonic forms. You're, you're it's not Platonic sp- because eventually uh, I want that stuff to get used. Yes. But uh, it's okay if it takes five or ten years for the community to realize this is the right thing to do. I've I've done this before. It's been the case before that you know I've made that that case. I mean, if you look back in the mid 2000s, for example, and you ask yourself the question, okay, I want to recognize cars or faces or whatever. Uh, you know, I can use convolutional net, so I can use sort of more conventional 
uh, kind of computer vision techniques, you know, using uh, interest point detectors or SIFT, density features and, you know, sticking an SVM on top. At that time, the data sets were so small that those methods that use more hand engineering worked better than ComNets. There was just not enough data for ComNets. And ComNets were, were a, little, a little slow with the kind of hardware that was available at the time. And there was a sea change when, uh, basically when, you know, data sets became bigger and, and GPUs became available. That That's what, you know, the... Two of the main factors that basically made people change their change their mind, um, and you can you can look at the history of like all sub branches of AI or pattern recognition, and there is a similar trajectory followed by techniques where people start by you know engineering the hell out of it, um, you know, be it optical character recognition, speech recognition computer vision, like image recognition in general, uh, natural language understanding, like, you know, translation, things like that, right? You start to engineer the hell out of it. Um, you start to acquire all the knowledge, the prior knowledge you know about image formation, about, you know, the shape of characters, about, you know, morphological operations, about like feature extraction, Fourier transforms, you know, Wernicke moments, you know, whatever, right? People have come up with thousands of ways of representing images so that you, they could be easily uh, uh, classified uh, afterwards. Same for speech recognition, right? There is, you know, two decades for people to figure out a good front end uh, to preprocess uh, uh, speech signals so that, you know, the information about what is being said is preserved, but most of the information about the identity of the speaker is gone. Um, you know, Kestrel coefficients or whatever, right? Um, and same for, for text, right? Uh, you do named entity recognition and you parse and you 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 do a tagging of, uh, of, of the parts of speech and, you know, you do this sort of tree representation of uh, clauses and all that stuff, right? Before you can do anything. Um, so that's how it starts, right? Just engineer the hell out of it. And then... You start having data, and maybe you have more powerful computers. Maybe you know something about statistical learning. So you start using machine learning, and it's usually a small sliver on top of your kind of handcrafted system where you know you extract features by hand. Okay, and now you know nowadays the standard way of doing this is that you train the entire thing end to end with a deep learning system, and it learns its own features. And and you know speech recognition systems nowadays. Uh, or OCR systems are completely end to end. It's uh, you know it's some giant neural net that takes raw waveforms and produces a sequence of characters coming out, mm -hmm. and it's just a huge neural net, right? There's no you know, Markov model, there's no language model that is explicit other than you know something that's ingrained in the in the sort of neural language model, if you want. Same for translation, same for all kinds of stuff. So you see this continuous evolution from you know less and less handcrafting. And more and more learning, um, and uh, I, I think uh, I mean it's true in biology as well. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, we might disagree about this. Maybe not uh, in this one little piece at the end. You mentioned active learning. It feels like active learning, which is the selection of data and also the interactivity, needs to be part of this giant neural network. You cannot just be an observer to do self-supervised learning. You have to, well. I don't, self-supervised learning is just the word, but I would, whatever this giant stack of a neural network that's automatically learning, it feels, my intuition is that you have to have a system, whether it's a physical robot or a digital robot that's interacting with the world and doing so in a flawed way and improving over time in order to, to form the self-supervised learning well, you can't just give it a giant sea of data. Okay, I agree and I disagree. Okay, I agree in the sense that I think uh, I agree. I agree in two ways. The first, the first way I agree is that if you want, uh, and you certainly need a causal model of the world that allows you to predict the consequences of your actions, to train that model, you need to take actions, right? You need to be able to act in a world and see the effect for you to be to learn causal models of the world. Well, so that's right? not that's not obvious because you can observe others. You can observe others. And you can that's infer true. that they're similar to you and then you can learn from that. Yeah, but then you have to kind of hardwire that part, right? Yeah. And you know, mirror neurons and all that stuff, right? So, um, and it's not clear to me how you would do this in a machine. So, um, 
um, so I think the the action part would be necessary for having causal models of uh, of the world. Uh, the second reason it may be necessary or at least more efficient is that uh, active learning basically you know goes for the jugular of what you what you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Is is you know obvious areas of uncertainty uh, about your your world and about the, how the world behaves and you can resolve this uncertainty by systematic exploration of that part that you don't you don't know and if you know that you don't know then you know it makes you curious you kind of look into situations that and uh you know across the animal uh world different species at different levels of curiosity, curiosity. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah depending on how they build That's right funny. so you know cats and rats are incredibly curious uh, dogs not so much i mean yeah. less yeah so it could be useful to have that kind of curiosity. So it'd be useful, but curiosity just makes the process faster. It doesn't make the process exist. Yeah. The So what process, what learning process is it that right. active learning makes more efficient? Mm-hmm. And I'm asking that first question. Uh, you know, you know, we yeah. haven't answered that question yet. So, you know, I'll worry about active learning once this question is... Uh, so it's the more fundamental question to ask... And if active learning or uh, interaction increases the efficiency of the learning, see, sometimes it becomes very different if the increase is several orders of magnitude, right? Like That's true. But fundamentally, it's still the same thing and yeah. building up the intuition about how to, f- in a self-supervised way, to construct background models, efficient or inefficient, is um, yeah. is the core problem.